in the word and walking in obedience unto your word, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would correct us, convict us, encourage us, Lord. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Father, I pray that you would increase our faith, Lord God, increase your grace over our life, Father. I pray that you would give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord God. Lord, it said, I remember the disciples said, Lord, at the end of the gospel that as, as you walked with them, Lord, that their hearts burned within them, oh God. I pray, Father, that our hearts would burn within us, oh God, as we receive your word that gives us life that gives us healing that breaks yokes of bondage that breaks bands of wickedness up off of your people oh God and I pray father that we would strive and give everything that we have Lord father God to follow after you Lord God and that we will not be weary in well doing for in due season we will reap in abundance if we faint not and and, and just to, to, to know that there's times that we may feel weary and the enemy would want us to feel kind of nation and shame Lord but we know Lord God that you are perfecting us in this journey Lord Father God in the in this this walk Lord God that you are perfecting us Lord so I pray that you cleanse any of anything out of us Lord God purify our hearts Lord God purify our minds I pray the mind of Jesus Christ over each person here Lord purify our hands Lord God in the spirit Lord God as we prepare to sit at your table Lord God receive your word Lord the bread of life Father God may it fill us Lord God spiritually Lord God burn us Lord God burn our heart Lord God with your word Lord you said you make your angel spirits and your ministers a flame of fire father I pray that you would just pour spiritual gasoline on us Lord God as we receive your word father I pray oh God that that we would just draw closer to you father I pray Lord God that we would have a boost Lord God of energy Lord God to do your will father that when our body our flesh feels tired Lord that you strengthen our spirit man in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and the church said amen. amen amen pastor eddie let you amen how's everyone doing tonight good man it's good to be here we had a little uh change in schedule so uh, <laughs> i said all right you know the lord knows what needs to happen amen now, look, I come all the way from work, all the way uh, almost to Baton Rouge, right? And, man, the weather was so, so terrible out there. And I had to stop for gas. I was like, man, what am I going to do? I need to make it on time, but praise God, uh, he made a way, amen? But I mention that because, you know, a lot of people don't like to attend church on Wednesday. Let's just say what, say what it is, right? A lot of people don't like to turn, attend church on Wednesday because they've got work. You've got kids, you've got a family, you've got to cook, you've got to clean, you've got to wake up early. Trust me, I know all of that because 3 o'clock comes early. Amen? 3 o'clock comes early. But Warrior Wednesday is a great opportunity and a great time to be refilled. Amen? Because I don't know about you, but Sunday is great. We get pumped up, we get refilled, re-energized, right? We, we get that gasoline in our tank. And then what happens? You go to work Monday. And it's like, really? Really, Lord? You know? And then you go to work the second Monday. Some people call that Tuesday. All right? <laughs> and then by Wednesday, I don't know about you, but if you're like me, you know, it's like, all right, I, I need to refill again. Right? So uh, at, at uh, a friend of mine's church, they call it the hour of power, right? They come in for an hour, well, basically an hour, and I think since it's been an hour and a half, two hours, but just for that refilling, that re-energizing to make it through the rest of the week, amen? Now, how many of you know, uh, last couple of times I've been preaching, it's been about different qualities, right? And there's no better quality than character. Who can give me a definition, and it doesn't have to be exact out of Webster's Dictionary, but who can give me a definition of character if i were to ask you what what your description of character is how what would you say what would be your response anybody and there's no right or wrong answer here so don't don't feel embarrassed how you treat somebody okay no that's good how you treat somebody that says a lot about your character right because guess what if you have bad character and you treat you mistreat people are, are they going to want to be around you probably not right Another definition of character. Anybody? Definition. What is it? Behaviors. Behaviors, right. 
character can be related to behaviors, right? Again, it goes back to how they say, if you're not behaving well, then chances are you probably got bad character, right? And, and if you don't have great character, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of people flocking to be by your side, right? Amen? And I'll take one more. Is there one more definition for a character? How you react to things around you, that's good. How do you react to things around you? That says a lot about your character, right? Because I don't know about you, but where I work, <laughs> people come with a lot of foolishness, right? And you can't retaliate the way you want to, not only because you're Christian, but also because, you know, uh, working in a plant, we, you get, you know, monetary compensation that's, that's really well. So you don't want to mess any of that up, right? Having good character. I tell people all the time that for me, character is what are you doing when nobody else is watching, right? What are you doing when nobody else is watching, amen? What are you doing when nobody else is watching? Tonight we'll be coming out of Acts 12. If you have your Bible or if you uh, need to borrow one, there should be one in the seat back pocket there. If not, you can read with the neighbor. Acts 12, I want to start with chapter 1. Herod's violence to the church. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. It goes on to read, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Amen? Thought he was seeing a vision. It's, I don't know about you, but it's good to see vision, right? It's good to have vision. It's good to dream dreams. It's good to know and realize that when God gives you a vision, it's for a certain purpose. And today we know that Herod lacked character, right? And because of that, he lost everything. Does anyone here know about ego? Anybody? Anybody know about ego? Right? Some people have it, some people like it, and some people just have, have an abundance of it, right? Ego. We know that ego drove King Herod of Paul's day just as it had, drove, had driven his father and his grandfather. They all desperately lacked character. Very good. Somebody's been reading my notes. Every, uh, they all lack character. Now here's the thing. Herod was a surname of the family of rulers who held power by the permission of the Roman Empire. Herod the Great ruled at the time of Jesus' birth. He's the one who actually killed all the male babies in Bethlehem. Can you imagine that, having to give that order? That, what does that say about Herod's character, Right? When you can just stand up there and, hey, um, by the way, tomorrow we're going to kill all the firstborns, right? Herod Antipas ordered the beheading of John the Baptist. Again, what does that say about his character? What kind of person he is, you know, to give out such an order? Right. The Herods in Act 12 is Herod Agrippa the first, the grandson of Herod the Great. 
right? Now, because Herod's lack character, this provides us with many examples of what not to do as a leader. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the past few times I've been preaching on the Wednesday, it's all about leadership, right? Starting to cultivate and develop a leader. All of these attributes or qualities, you know, are what makes a great leader. Now, verse 1 says, he mistreated his own citizens, right? What did we, what did we read earlier? It said that uh, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Hello. Why, why would you do that? It's the church. Could you imagine somebody trying to do that today? If the president or somebody else gave a decree and said, hey, we're going to go out there and mess with the church just because. But you think about it, they're doing that currently, right? They really are. We know that Herod mistreated his own citizens. He unjustly ordered the arrest of Jewish believers in order to harass them. Unjustly. They didn't do anything wrong, just walk in the street. But because they were Jew and because they didn't believe what the Romans believed, right? They believed in a different God and, and had a different church. Herod wanted to arrest them. Verse 2 tells us that he executed innocent people. He executed innocent people. How do we know that? Because it says so. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He had James killed by the sword, although he had committed no crime. Again, could you imagine walking the street and saying, hey, come here. We're going to, for no crime, no crime whatsoever, right? Now, everyone's kind of in an uproar about things going on and, and how, you know, they got the mark of the beast coming and they've got Apple Pay or Google Pay or Amazon pay, right? Where the Palm pay, right? Yeah, so my, my wife was showing me that, and I was like, man, you know, that, that's crazy. And then I had seen a story not too long ago where there's an uh, Amazon store. I think it's Amazon. Amazon store in New York where you don't even have to scan anything. Like, you walk by the cooler and pick out the juice or whatever, and it's already paid for. It already comes out to your account. It gets charged to your account or however, however it works, right? But could you imagine, I mean, just, just the world that, that we live in currently and give it 10 years? I, I can't even fathom, like, what, what's going to be next, right? I know it's kind of off subject, but I remember growing up and, and all the rant and rave was by whatever, I don't know, 2020. You know, we're going to have flying cars and, and all of that. And I was like, yeah, hey, it sounds cool, you know. That, that's wild. Now look, Herod made bad decisions based on popularity. Has anyone ever had a decision or made a decision on popularity? Yeah, you know? Yeah, I do it all the time, you know? My wife tells me she wants to go eat here, and we go. <laughs> Popular decision, right? Plus, I don't want to get no black eyes, so... <laughs> When Herod saw it pleased the Jews to kill James, he had Peter arrested also. So if Herod killed James and it drew the crowds and people were excited about it and he had Peter arrested, what do you think was going to happen to Peter? What was the plan ultimately? Death, to kill him, right? Because that was going to draw the people. That was going to make Herod popular and can you imagine the society, the, the character of the people during this time, the character of Herod to just randomly, well, I'm sure not randomly because they were Jews, but, you know, to pick people out and have them executed for no reason? That's wild. Herod acted irrationally in difficult times. Anyone know that somebody that doesn't work well under pressure? <laughs> right? Herod doesn't work well under pressure. He killed the 16 guards who had been on duty at the time of Peter's prison escape. 
So if you're not familiar with the story, we know that the chains fell off and Peter escaped, and, and then what happened? As we just read, let me see where are we at, verse 19. I know we hadn't read it, but uh, then as soon as it was day, there was no, no small stir amongst the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But then Herod had searched for him and not found him. He examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. This man has a rough and tough character, right? It's like he's got to flex his muscle all the time. Oh, you're not going to do what I said, or you're not going to behave in a certain way, or you're not going to respond in a certain way? There's only one answer to it. And, and so far, what has it been? Killing people. Yeah, it's death, execution, right? So he killed the 16 guards that had been at, on duty at the time of Peter's prison escape. I'm not, I'm not a prison guard, but I can imagine somebody that's high profile like Peter, right? He's got to be high profile. Do you think they just had the new guy standing guard watching them? Probably not. Right? They probably had like the top dogs, like the, the I don't know, the, the Navy SEALs, right? Or somebody. Right, yeah. The, whatever the highest rank was for this, these Roman soldiers there that were available, he probably had those guys guarding Peter. And we know that because Peter escaped, 16 people lost their life. We know that Herod harbored anger towards others. You think so? You think Herod had, had a character of anger? Absolutely. Let's read it. Verse 20. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and uh, Sidon. But they came to him with one accord. And having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Amen. He sought power out of insecurity. Herod sought power out of insecurity. We know that because he wasn't a secure king, right? He had, again, like we said earlier, he had to flex his muscle, right? He went out there and he ruled by force. He ruled by violence. And we know if people didn't respond well, or if he felt threatened, what do you think was going to happen? Same thing. He was to be taken out, right? He, Herod enjoyed controlling others, especially loved having people at his mercy. He enjoyed people begging for their lives. He enjoyed people asking for mercy. So again, it goes back to character. What does this say about the kind of character that King Herod had, right? He had to have had something. You think about everything, and I, I probably should have wrote it down. That, that's my fault. But everything from his grandfather, right? Um, the Herod of Acts 12 is Herod Agrippa I, we said. The grandson of Herod the Great. And who was Herod the Great? Does anyone recall? He would have been the king during Jesus' birth. He would have been the king during, during Jesus' birth. That's Herod the Great. And Herod Antipas, Antipas ordered the beheading of John the Baptist. So that would have been his father. So again, what, what I, again, I said earlier, our character, for me, that definition is what you're doing when nobody's looking, or in this case, who are we, how are we getting our character? Who are we looking at? Who are we developing our character from, right? If I, if I said, Brother Gavin, you know, I'm going to hang out with you all this week because I want to I wanna see your true character. You know, I want to glean from you. I want to learn from you. And I want to develop my character to be just like you. Well, what would that say? If he's upstanding and doing what's right and reading his word, and, and it's almost, a, in a sense, discipleship. Right? Because we see something in another individual that we want to have. That, that's what we see. Right? If I see good qualities, 
<clears throat> if I see good qualities in an individual, oh, man, I want some of that, right? Right, Brother Lester? If I see good qualities in you, I want to hang out with you. I want to get to know you, and I want to develop my character based on the things I saw from you, right? Why? Because that, that's, how, that's how we grow. That's how we become better. I tell people all the time when I was in the military, I had this sergeant that we just, uh, we just couldn't see eye to eye, right? Why? Because this was his famous saying. He always said, do as I say, not as I do. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you're supposed to be leading us, right? I need to learn from you. Everything, like, like what to do, what to do properly, and how to lead others. And here you're like, yeah, well, just do it this way, but don't do what I do, you know? Don't, don't go to work, stay in the smoke pen. Or don't do this, hang out in the office, you know? And I was like, I told myself, I said, when I get promoted to that rank, I definitely want to learn, like I've been saying, from other people and take bits and pieces because you're not going to have somebody with flawless character. It just isn't going to happen, right? But we can take small pieces. I can take small pieces from Alexis. I can take small pieces from Lester. I can take small pieces from Brother Gavin, and then I can kind of make the, the gumbo, right, the gumbo character of, of myself, right? Amen? Herod sought power out of insecurity. He enjoyed controlling others and especially loved having people at his mercy. He projected an infallible image. Verse 21 and 22, an infallible image. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an, or an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. What, what a way to go. Right? You're dressed in your Sunday best. And you're talking to people. And it's all about you. Right? We read that. It's all about you. Me, 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 me. But you see what happens when we don't give glory to God? When we don't point everyone back? Because it's not about me. Right? It's, how does the pastor say it? Not about me, but all about he? Yeah. Right? Right. Exactly. Not my way, Yahweh. That's it. Um, he loved wearing his royal garb and being worshipped. And that's what happens, right? We get, we get in, in a certain mindset, and hey, I'm not one to... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to offend anyone. But, you know, if you have to walk around with a white collar to say that, that you're a minister, I mean, to me, there's something kind of wrong with that, right? Because it's like you're flashing it with, uh, with neon lights, like, hey, look at me. Look who I am, right? Hey, if you want to wear one, cool, by all means. But let's just make sure that, that the motive is right, right? We said that Herod projected an infallible image. Look at me. All lies on me. And what happened? It cost him. Ultimately, it cost him his life. That's, that's true. And that's good. Ate him from the inside out. Verse 23. We learned that, um, or oh, I already read that. The, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. He was blinded by his own ego. We said that word earlier, ego, right? Herod was blinded by his own ego. Ego. He lived in an unreal world that couldn't see how his ego sabotaged his leadership. When it becomes all about us and we're not willing to be, to be uh, the, proper, the proper kind of leader that people need to have good character and to develop good character, then what happens? We get blinded, right? Because we don't want to see what other people see. Or we don't want to receive what other people are telling you. Hey, you might want to alter your, your character a little bit, you know. Because I don't like the way that, that, or people don't like the way that you said this. Or you did this. Or how you responded to that. Right? 
It's all about building your character for God. Amen? When we have a positive character, then what happens? What happens? If we have a positive character, people... People are going to flock to you. They want to be with you. They want to learn from you. They want to be discipled by you. Why? Because it's like, oh, man, I I want what Brother Gavin's got. Right? I want what Brother Dustin's got. I want what Pastor's got. Why? Because it's contagious. When it has good, good mean, good, good meat behind it, you know, it's contagious. It's, It's appealing. It draws people. Amen? Yes, amen, it's genuine. And it's not about, it's not about, uh, I say us, but it's not about anyone that's preaching. It's not about pastoring. It's not about how we look or how we speak. Or, it's not about any of that, right? At the end of the day, we know that it's only about one. It's about Jesus. Amen? So let me ask you this. How do we avoid Herod's trap? How do we avoid having bad character if we want to improve our character and build a solid foundation for our own leadership our own style of leadership here are the things you have to do okay here are the things you have to do if you're taking notes if you're uh listening on live there's four things we need to do you've got to search for the cracks okay you have to search for the cracks when you're building foundation Right? When you're building a solid foundation, what do you have to do? You have to make sure it's what? Make sure it's even, okay? Make sure it's even, make sure it's level. Most importantly, make sure there's no what? No cracks. Right? Because what happens what happens when there's cracks, there's gaps in the foundation? It's not gonna be good anymore. Right? You see it all the time, especially here in South Louisiana. If you don't have a strong foundation, or the foundation isn't level, or it's got a crack in it, then, then what happens? The house isn't good anymore. And literally, you can't, even, you can't even sell it. You know? It doesn't happen. Look at the major areas in your life. Identify where you're weak and have taken shortcuts. <laughs> Identify where you're weak and taking shortcuts. Hold on. Nah, I don't, nah. First off, I'm not weak and I haven't taken any shortcuts. I'm lying. (laughs) What am I I saying here? Sometimes we can't identify our own weaknesses, right? That's hard to do because guess what? I don't know about you, but do you guys like admitting your weaknesses? Nobody does. Why? Because then that means we're weak. Right? Ask somebody you really trust. Somebody that really is going to hold you and keep you accountable. Right? Take them to lunch. Go walk the park. Whatever you need to do to get some alone time. Look, I need a favor. Can you point out my weaknesses to me? And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Exactly that. You're not, you're not going to like what people have to tell you. When you've got weaknesses, you're not going to want to hear what they have to say. Right? I'm telling you now, you better learn to develop that. That tough skin. Because if they're really a friend, or whoever you pick, if they're really being honest with you, and and obviously make sure it's not a beat down, okay? If you're asked to do that for somebody, please, you know, I'm not saying to lie to them, but just, just do it with love, you know what I mean? Do it with love. What are your weaknesses and what shortcuts have you taken? Number two, we need to look for patterns, okay? What are patterns? Patterns can be anything. Patterns can be, you know, what time do you show up for church? How often do you read your Bible? Um, How about this? Do any weaknesses remain? Because maybe you're doing great and you're in stride and everything's going, and then all of a sudden you take a detour, 
right? You take that detour, and then what happens? Oh, great. Here's a weakness, right? You don't got another cheeseburger in front of you. Here's a weakness, right? Patterns can help you diagnose character flaws. You could be great at everything, and there's that one character flaw, right? Every time you see brother, and this isn't true. This is just an example, okay? Just an example. <laughs> Every time I see Brother Gavin, I just, ah, uh, just it drives me, and I don't know why. You know, but we need to get to the root of that and figure out why. Because at the end of the day, I shouldn't have any odd against my brother, right? Right, absolutely. I don't know if you can hear, but like. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> Alexis is saying that, that, and it's true, it's something in us. You know, it may, my brother may have not done anything to me. I just don't like the color glasses he's wearing today. Right? <laughs> we have to find out what our weaknesses are. We have to find out if any weaknesses remain and find any patterns so we can diagnose our character flaws. Right? Because at the end of the day, we all have some kind of character flaw, right? It's like we said for the first one. We have to identify the cracks. We have to search for the cracks. When we can plug or fill those cracks and we can avoid them altogether, then that gives us a solid foundation to, to build off of. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Face the music. Face it head on. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be grimy, right? But when we can face the music, we can, we can face it head on. Character repairs begins when we face our flaws, right? Character repairs begin when we face our flaws and apologize to those you've wronged. Oh, man, that's, that, <laughs> that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Because I'm telling you now, when you go and try and, and, and hopefully not, Hopefully not. But when you go and try and apologize to somebody for a wrong that you've done to them or said about them or, or made them feel or whatever the case is, you're going to have several responses, right? But I can guarantee you the one that's probably going to surprise you the most is going to be, yeah, whatever, I don't forgive you. And how do you think that's going to make you feel? How is that going to make you feel? goes back to what we just talked about. What weaknesses remain? Oh, really? Oh, you don't forgive me? Well, guess what? I... What weaknesses remain? Right? Character repairs begin when you face your flaws and apologize for those you've wronged. The last one here. Stay teachable and rebuild. Pastor Arnolfo mentioned it Sunday. If you haven't seen that, um, I was going to say episode. <laughs> That's funny. If you, haven't, if you haven't seen that video from Sunday, if you haven't seen the live from Sunday, I encourage you to go back, check it out. Man, it, it's a good word. And, and this is what he talked about, you know. He said, you have to be teachable. But he said it in this way, and I've, I've preached this before. You have to be a fat Christian. F-A-T. You have to be a fat Christian. You have to be F, faithful. You have to be A, available. And for me, most importantly, you have to be teachable. Faithful, available, teachable. And that's what they talk about here. Stay teachable and rebuild. Once you face your past... Create a plan to build inward strength. Once you face your past, your past, you can build a past up. Hello. Once you face your past, you can build a path to inward strength. Amen. Once you face it and you face it head on, then you can start rebuilding because at the end of the day, you're not gonna you're not gonna need it for for somebody else, right? Do I need forgiveness for somebody else? No. 
Do I need to build character for somebody else? No. Who do we do that for? We do that for ourselves. Amen? We do that for ourselves. When we have character, and it's honest character, it's good character, when we don't lack character, people are going to see that. People are gonna gonna man, you know, Brother Lester, I don't know what it is, but there's something about you. There's something about you. Sister Amy, I don't know what it is, but there's something there's just something about you. <laughs> That's always my response too. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> right? We have to build character, amen. Stay teachable and rebuild. What do we say about being a, a Christian? What is it? We have to be a fat Christian. Faithful, available, and teachable. Amen? Let's end with this. With building character, it kind of starts with, with servanthood, right? We know that servanthood is, is a big part of the church. And a lot of times we think, oh, man, they're asking me to serve because they've got this big task that's ahead of them, right? We need to get things in order. And like my wife likes to say, many hands make for light work, right? Many hands make for light work, yes. Many hands make for light work. But look, when it comes to servanthood, there's no task that's too small. How many of you like to serve? Yeah? Everyone? Well, just about everyone likes to serve. If any early church leader could be called a servant, it's going to be Barnabas. Is anyone familiar with Paul and Barnabas? Uh, who was Barnabas and what did he do? Anyone want to recall real quick? What? Who was Barnabas? He, he, the traveling partner for Paul, right? Paul, Barnabas, and who else? Simon. Silas? Barnabas took the initiative and did whatever it took to raise morale, to raise people up, and to raise money for the church. Amen? He led with clarity and example by becoming a servant. He considered no task too small, and what allowed Barnabas to demonstrate such a lifestyle? What do you think it allowed Barnabas to, to display such a lifestyle of servanthood? We talked about character, and we, now we're talking about servanthood. Why was Barnabas such, uh, so servant-minded? Barnabas was servant-minded because of this. He had nothing to prove. He had nothing to prove, right? Oh, look at me. I'm going to go and vacuum the carpet on the stage. Look at me. I'm going to go and clean the restroom. Look at me. I'm going to scrub down the kitchen. Hey, by the way, I cleaned pastor's office earlier. Barnabas didn't have to play games. He never sought to, uh, to limelight. Anyone know what limelight means? Yeah, when you, yeah, you want the spotlight, right? You want the limelight. Hey, look at me. Showing up looking all sparkly. When, he, when um, Barnabas mentored Paul, he happily let the emerging apostles rise above him. I say that time and time again. When you can take somebody, you can take another brother, another sister, and you can elevate them to be better than you are, that should be the ultimate goal. Amen? That's a sign of a true servant. When you can make somebody greater than you, you've got, nothing, you've got nothing else to prove, right? You've got nothing else to prove. Barnabas didn't feel the need to project himself, his self-worth, or prove himself to anybody. He didn't have to prove himself, but he wanted to serve because that was his heart. Amen? That was his heart. We said that Barnabas had nothing to lose. Barnabas didn't have to guard his reputation or fear 
that he would lose popularity. Sometimes we can think that, right? Oh, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to clean bathrooms cuz that's going to make me unpopular. You know? I'm not going to serve behind the line serving food uh, for outreach because I want to be out there hanging out with the people and, and, and let people know where I'm at and who I am and, and all of that, right? No, he wasn't worried about his reputation. He wasn't worried about what people saw or what, what people uh, thought about him, right? He came to serve and not be served. This enabled him to focus on giving, not getting as a servant, he had no rights to lose. He didn't have to focus on what everyone else thought, right? Because he served wholeheartedly. He came to serve and not be served. And the last thing here, he had nothing to hide. Barnabas had nothing to hide. Barnabas didn't maintain a facade. What's a facade? For for show, right? Just uh, it, it's fake, right? It's a facade. He didn't have to. He didn't have to maintain a facade or an image. He remained authentic. Let me tell you, that is such a rarity today, for people to remain authentic. You know, and you see it all the time. Whether it's, you know, social media, whether it's um, anything. Well, I guess technically online, right? Sometimes. People just have a way of, of hiding everything because that, that's what the culture says to do now these days, right? Hide behind the keyboard, hide behind the computer screen, hide behind partitions, a mask, whatever the case might be. But Barnabas had nothing to hide. He didn't maintain a facade or an image. He remained authentic, vulnerable, and transparent. When we're authentic, that makes us vulnerable, right? Because people get to see the real you. But it's such a beautiful thing when we're doing it properly, right? When we've got great character, we've got no, no ill intentions, it can be a great thing. Um, and being transparent, tell people all the time, who I am at church who is who I am at the house, who I am on the street, who I am at work, th this is me. This is what you get. I'm not going to, oh, let me put on my pastor hat and go and act a different way, you know, or let me go home and put on the, the dad hat or the husband hat or, or the home hat, right? Oh, back to church again. Let's put on that, that white collar we talked about, right? We should be the same no matter where we go, no matter what we're doing. Barnabas could rejoice in others' victories, and he never wondered about his own fame. It's great to celebrate other people, right? Brother Derek, right? Is it not great to celebrate other people? It is. This man here, you went to Florida and then to Tennessee. Or is that reversed? Oh, even to New York too? Well, look, I'm, I'm outside the loop. So even went to New York. Now, what were you doing up, up there? So you're serving. Serving God's people, right? And did, did you get the, a badge or a patch or, or recognition? Did you get a silver star? Or, so what, what did you get? Hold on. So wait a minute. You're telling me that you went, traveled the country, serving God's people, right? And you did it all for the joy of the Lord? That's it. That's it. Amen. Barnabas never wondered about his own fame. It didn't matter what people thought. It didn't matter if he was going to get paid or not. It didn't matter if he was going to get recognition or not. If he was going to be called up in front of the stage and, and everyone clap for it, that wouldn't have mattered to Barnabas. Why should it matter to us, right? We should all strive to have a servant heart. If God called you to be another Barnabas to another Paul, if you knew that this was new emerging leader who could over, soon overshadow you, 
right? It, it's easy to get caught up with, oh, man, I don't know if I can serve under, under Sister Alexis because, you know, that's, uh, she's on the rise, and, and I, don't want, I don't want her to outdo me. I don't want her to outshine me. What kind of mindset is that having? What does that say about our character, right? Let me ask you this rhetorical question here. Would you be willing to accept a call? Would you be willing to accept a call? In other words, are you a servant? Are you a servant? You must love your people more than a position. You've got to love people more than a position. I've got a pastor friend who uh, actually has her doctorate now. I won't, I won't say her name, but had to face a lot of opposition because of who she is and what she does. You see, it's a lady, and she's a senior pastor of not one, but two churches. And you know what she would tell us all the time? Not because she wanted to brag, not because she wanted people to, to think high and mighty of her, but she would say this. She said, after every service, I would make sure to go and personally clean the bathroom. Senior pastor of not one but two churches would go and personally clean the bathroom. Why? Because she never wanted to forget that she was that she people think or whatever that she was above doing that <clears throat> right she wanted to to maintain that servant heart amen let's stand on our feet we'll have a time for questions and answers uh you know thoughts whatever uh after we close out here but i just wanted to pray and can we do that can we pray Father God, we thank you for this night, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to share who you are, Father. And most importantly, just to help us to discover ourselves, Lord, that you would begin to develop our character, Lord, that the areas where we're weak, the areas that we need help, Father, that you would reveal them to us, Lord, that you would help us to build that firm foundation that isn't full of cracks, Lord, but that's solid, Lord solid with your word, solid with your love, Father, and something that we can build upon, Lord. Help us to be servant-minded. Help us to serve others for your name's sake, Lord. Not for recognition, not because people are telling us to, Lord, but because we truly, truly want to follow in your footsteps, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll gather here um, in these inward seats if you if you like, and we'll have um, some questions, answers.